I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen McGuire. Um, Stephen is from uh, beautiful uh, Parmos, New Jersey. Uh, Stephen received a bachelor's of arts at, from Rivers University and worked as a biochemist before moving to California to pursue a master's in viticulture and enology. Uh, since then, he has worked harvest at Sterling Vineyards, spent time at Harvestite, Sparkling Wine, and um, Notre View State Winery, and is currently employed at Berrios Brewing. Uh, after graduation, Stephen plans to travel to Spain um, to work for a sherry producer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Josh. Um, so my, my talk today will be about bioprotection or the uses of non-saccharomyces yeast in winemaking as an alternative to sulfites. So today what we'll be going over is um, what is bioprotection, how it's used, uh, what is its parts effects on winemaking and, and wines, and also what are the commercial products of, that are currently available on the market. Um, okay, and so um, a question is why do we need an alternative to sulfites? Uh, well, there's a number of reasons. One of them being, well, a major one being sort of a, you know, climate change and as temperature rises in many wine growing regions, it yields wines that are, uh, have higher pH levels. And this necess necessitates either uh, adding tartaric additions to lower the, the acidity or to increase the SO2 levels to maintain its microbial effectiveness as the pH levels rise in the must. Its uh, microbial effectiveness of SO2, its molecular SO2 concentration decreases. And uh, even more, as many spoilage microbes are able to contaminate wines even with the use of SO2. Notably, some Britannomyces strains were shown to tolerate concentrations over 0.6 milligrams per liter of molecular SO2. And uh, acetic acid bacteria have been found in wines containing over 20 milligrams per liter of molecular SO2. And in contrast to that, there are many lactic acid bacteria that are important to malolactic fermentation, which are often inhibited uh, by SO2. So there's a, a balance between you know, using Yes, SO2 to diminish the levels of <clears throat> uh, microbes that you don't want in your wine while not inhibiting the microbes that you do want in wine. And also notably, SO2 does have uh, some health effects, usually in the levels of wine, you don't see these health effects, but in certain people it can cause irritation, uh, dizziness, headaches, and in very sensitive individuals, it can cause allergic reactions and even severe asthmatic reactions. Uh, so, uh, another big reason and sort of why I've been looking at bioprotection is changes in consumer preferences. This is something that is actually quite uh, important and has changed quite drastically in the past few years. Uh, many consumers are now leaning towards uh, minimal intervention or low sulfite wines, whether that be for health reasons or perceived health reasons. And uh, it's estimated that in 2023, a billion bottles of organic wine are going to be consumed around the world. And that's tripling, nearly tripling from 349 million in 2012. So there is quite a big market for uh, producing wines that are minimal intervention or low sulfite. Um, however, the, the US is, is uh, usually quite a, a small fraction of that organic wine sold around the world. That's mostly because the organic wine, um, the laws surrounding that are quite strict. Uh, you're not allowed to add any sulfites for wines labeled organic and even more so you need to prove that by analysis that they have less than 10 milligrams per liter of total uh, sulfites, which is quite a strict requirement. Um, but so uh, what's needed is now then to figure out a way to uh, make low sulfite wines and minimal intervention wines um, and without the use of SO2, but you still need to make a quality product. So you need to have a sort of an alternative to maintain your microbial levels in your wine to, to still have a quality product. And so what is bioprotection then? Uh, bioprotection is the addition of yeast, bacteria, or a mixture of microorganisms on grape must before fermentation in order to reduce the use of chemical preservatives. And there's a number of, of different genera that have been identified for bioprotection. And I put them up on the screen there. Uh, however, this is both species and strain dependent. Um, <clears throat> not every species in these genera have bioprotection capabilities. And the, the effectiveness of the bioprotection of these species uh, changes based on strain as well. A few that have been noted as being uh, particularly effective 
have been Turla spora delbrueckii <clears throat> and uh, Metchnikovia pulcarima. And the modes of action that have been identified, there's two main ones, uh, one being killer factor production or the competition for nutrients. And we'll take a look at that uh, next. So for killer factors or zymosins, which are antifungal compounds, they are secreted proteins or glycoproteins that deplete the proton motor force of the cell membrane and killing the target cell. Uh, the cell that produces the killer factors are immune to their own killer factor. Uh, and usually this, this is a, against a closely related species or strain. It was first found in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, which was attacked other strains of Saccharomyces. But it was found that the zymosins of non-Saccharomyces yeasts are more effective against a wider spectrum of species, making them uh, a viable option for, for controlling those species while not being effective against Saccharomyces yeast. And the activity of, of these cofactors is affected by pH, ethanol, uh, SO2 levels as well, and binding to tan as other binding agents and compounds in wine, as well as the ratio of killer uh, cells to sensitive cells. The greater amount of killer cells you have uh, in comparison to the amount of sensitive cells, the greater effectiveness you have uh, for your killer factors. Uh, so here's a, an example <clears throat> of what these uh, killer factors have been shown to accomplish. So this is on Candida intermedia on Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Brettanomyces uh, bruxellensis. They, uh, these are colonies of the intermedia uh, done in triplicate. And so here are two different strains of Saccharomyces. And what they're looking at is the, uh, the buffer zone, <clears throat> the inhibition halo is what they, they called it, uh, of the inhibiting effect of um, the Candida colony on the Brettanomyces bruxellensis surrounding it. So we see here in these four different species or strains of Britannomyces, we see different levels of inhibition halos. This one being the greatest, where this uh, strain of Britannomyces is, is inhibited the most by this Candida colony. And you see less effectiveness on this one, as well as this strain and this one. But most importantly is that there is no inhibition halo when the Britannomyces, or when the Candida colony is on uh, lawn of Saccharomyces cerevisiae which is important because you don't want your, uh, your bioprotecting strain to also limit the growth of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is important for alcoholic fermentation. And so next, what they looked at is, are these uh, killer factors stable at wine conditions? And so these are two killer factors by two different yeasts. Um, this is uh, PICT, uh, which is a killer factor by Pickia anomala, and Quict, Cluvermyces uh, wickerhamii. And so what they looked at are, are these killer factors stable at wine conditions? And so here we have uh, different pH values. And both of these killer factors are active at wine pH values, um, you know, here between like four and about 3.4 sort of. Um, <clears throat> you see, especially in the Cluvermyces killer factor, you see that the effectiveness for the inhibition halo diminish as the pH decreases. However, this is, is beneficial. You'd rather have more effectiveness at higher pHs, which is where you're at most at risk for uh, contamination, as well as they checked uh, temperature values. So especially in the Pichia uh, killer factor, you see um, sort of maximum effectiveness all the way up until 35 degrees Celsius, which is about the upper limit of, of winemaking temperatures, uh, but less so for the Cluvermyces um, uh, killer factor. Sort of, sort of starts to diminish after 25 degrees Celsius, which would make this uh, less uh, reliable as a killer factor in um, wines where you're fermenting at higher temperatures. And then here on the left side, we're looking at the inhibition halos, is these bars, uh, as they show up as, the, um, <clears throat> as these species start to grow. So these are cell counts or OD levels. Um, <clears throat> so up down here is the Pickia killer factor, and up here is the uh, Cluvermyces killer factor. And what you would want is the Pickia uh, killer factor, where you see the start of the inhibition halo after five hours of inoculation, and sort of increasing after that and maintains its its effectiveness. <clears throat> Whereas the Cluvermyces killer factor sort of doesn't really show up until after a day of being inoculated and uh, reaches its maximum, but then sort of starts to diminish after only 12 hours. So that'll make it less useful uh, in winemaking. 
And then what we're looking at here is these same two killer factors uh, inoculated in Sangiovese wine. Uh, this is done at a uh, lab scale. And they just, it was a, a very small level of wine. And they directly added these killer factors. They didn't inoculate with these species. But what they did see is that the killer factors maintain their, their inhibition halo, maintain their, their bioprotection qualities over a period of 10 days. Uh, they, those, the inhibition halo diminished over 10 days. Um, but that shows that this has uh, the ability to protect your wine for likely throughout alcoholic fermentation. Uh, and so what we'll go to next is the other mode of, of action that has been hypothesized, or uh, which is competition for nutrients. And so what has been hypothesized that uh, just by inoculating these species of non-saccharomyces yeasts they're using, it maintains, it creates an antimicrobial activity just due to the biomass effect by growing, competing for nutrients, eating up uh, oxygen, lipids, nitrogens, vitamins, other nutrient compounds. Uh, but what is important is that you would want that the non-saccharomyces yeast that they are, uh, that you are um, inoculating with does not compete with Saccharomyces cerevisiae and does not deplete the oxygen and nutrients that uh, it needs to complete alcoholic fermentation. However, one other um, uh, notable a finding was that in Meshnikovia pulcherma was shown to produce pulcheraminic acid, which is uh, an iron chelator and it binds to uh, iron, uh, not making it available for some strains of, of other non saccharomyces, uh, specific, specifically Britannomyces bruxellensis. And then those species need that iron for development, and as such, it's not able to grow. So, this has been a, uh, a focus of, of, many, of much research. And so we'll, we'll look at that. We'll see uh, these are iron additions or separate fermentation. On the left here, we have uh, Mechnikovia pulcherma on Picchia yeast. And on the right here, it is on Mechnikovia pulcherma and Britannomyces. So we're seeing uh, four lines, two of these, these top two being in both uh, of these graphs are with iron additions. So you're adding iron over the limit of uh, the Mechnikovia or the pulcheramic acid is able to to bind to it. And in both of these cases, Britannomyces and Pichia are able to grow and, and continue to, to flourish in the fermentation. Um, and in these bottom two lines, you see here, it's difficult to see, but this, this um, bold line, the straight line is the Metricovia. <clears throat> and the dashed line here is the Metricovia. And then here is the Britannomyces uh, growth levels. And then here's the Pichia growth levels. Without the iron additions, we're seeing after uh, 16 days or 13 days in the Britannomyces case, we're seeing a diminished levels of, of growth and we're seeing essentially killing off of these yeasts, which is due to the, the pulcheramic acid binding to the iron and uh, not allowing it to, to be used by Pichia or Britannomyces. And what is uh, a main focus then is we see bioprotection qualities of the Michinkova pulcherama, but what's important is that it allow Saccharomyces cerevisiae to continue alcoholic fermentation. And here are these top two lines, these triangles are the Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, levels. And then the, these two lines here are two different <clears throat> uh, inoculation uh, levels of the Metinocobia pulcherma. And we see at this lower level, it drops off after six days. And at this higher level inoculation, it drops off after nine days and it allows Saccharomyces cerevisiae to continue, which is what you want. And then what's important then is what are the other effects of using non-Saccharomyces yeast? Uh, much of these, these yeasts have been noted for um, spoilage characteristics in the past. However, now they're being looked at as sort of favorable in, in winemaking practices, uh, especially as I said before, for climate change through the uh, production of lactic acid they're able to increase the acidity of the wine and decrease the pH values uh, without the additions of, of tartaric acid, which would make this beneficial in many uh, areas where acidity is an issue. And then also the reduction of, of, of ethanol. Um, the production of lactic acid pulls sugars away from the pathway to produce ethanol, and, and thus uh, you are left with a reduced amount of ethanol in the final wine. Some of the non saccharomyces yeasts are also able to participate in malolactic fermentation eliminating the need to add um, bacteria and possibly have um, spoilage characteristics arise from adding bacteria to your wine to uh, participate in malolactic fermentation. 
And then some of these yeasts have also had pectinase or uh, protease activity, which would help in uh, eliminating um, uh, protein haze or hazes related to pectinase and would also help in the, the filterability of the wine. Uh, and then also these, these yeasts have been shown to produce many aromatic compounds and other compounds important to the, the wine flavor profiles. Um, and in many cases, they lead to more fruity, fresher, and uh, acidic wines. And so we'll look at the, the other effects of non-saccharomized yeast. One of the main focuses has been on the anthocyanin composition, since that you're not adding SO2 and you're just adding uh, non-saccharomyces yeast. What was uh, hypothesized was that you'd see higher degrees of polymerization of the anthocyanins and a greater color intensity, since you're not having sulfites sort of bleach out some of the anthocyanins. But what was found in, um, <clears throat> I believe this, this is Mechnicovia, um, was that the, the bioprotection did not have a, a difference on the anthocyanin composition when compared to wines that had sulfites added to them. So these are three different wineries. We have these three bars so for winery one, winery two, and winery three. And we're seeing different levels between the two wines in each. So the orange is the sulfite of wines, the blue are the fire protected wines. <clears throat> and in one winery, you're seeing total proanthocyanins where the sulfite wines contain more. In one winery, the non-sulfited wines contain more. So there really isn't any, any trend emerging. We're seeing sort of just based on wine matrix, matrix effects is uh, the color intensity and uh, what the, the anthocyanin composition is, not based on whether or not you add sulfites or bioprotected bio species. And then even further, um, the Meshtakovia added in pre-fermentation did not impact the wine volatile compound compositions. So we're seeing again here, uh, this is winery one, the, uh, this is the sulfide wine, and this is the bioprotected wine. This is winery three, we have the sulfide wine and bioprotected wine, and then winery two, the sulfide wine and the bioprotected wine. And so we're seeing the compositions, this is a, a PCA 5.5, five, five. Um, <clears throat> is that the wines that are from the same winery are more similar than wines that are using the same uh, winemaking uh, methods. Uh, we see the most difference here in winery one, but for the most part, these wines are most similar, but based on the wine matrix and what winery they come from, rather than if they are sulfided or if they have uh, fire protected species added to them. And in addition, um, no trends were emerged in any uh, sensory profiles of bioprotected wines. Um, same thing as the previous two, we see some significant differences uh, here with color intensity here in this winery and then color intensity, color intensity here in this, in this winery as well. Um, but not in winery one, <clears throat> and also a number of different um, characteristics are, were found to be significantly different, uh, but color intensity was the only one that was found to occur in two wineries. The others, uh, roundedness and length, uh, tanning quality, uh, these ones were found not to be significantly different in more than one winery. So there really was no trends emerging in the sensory profiles of the two different uh, winemaking techniques. And then, so what we're gonna look at here is the different types of commercial starter cultures that are uh, available on the market currently. There already are a number of, of uh, products on the market. There's 26 coming from 11 different companies. The main three being uh, Christian Hansen, Lalamund, and Anartis. <clears throat> uh, many of these products uh, have quite bold claims. They claim to improve the aromatic complexity um, and or provide bioprotection, increase acidity, improved mouthfeel, uh, and most of these products are coming from these three uh, species, Tiller Spur, Dubrookii, uh, I believe it's Cluvermyces thermotolerance, uh, I forget what the K means on that one, and then Mechnicovia polycarama. And uh, Mechnicovia polycarama, as I uh, mentioned before, is mainly used uh, for providing fire protection, and uh, the thermotolerance species is mostly used for increasing acidity. It has uh, lactic acid production. And then Turlisboro del Brookii is uh, often used uh, for both, to both increase acidity and provide fire protection. And there's a number of other species that have been used, um, which claim to improve mouthfeel or the aromatic complexity of the wines. But it's important to note that a lot of these commercial products have not been uh, scientifically tested. And um, 
this is still a very open field that needs a lot of further scientific research. Um, but it's undoubtedly that that non-saccharomyces yeast will play an important role in, in future winemaking, not only for microbial protection, but for sort of terroir, um, you know, the, the native species uh, contributing to the terroir of the wine, as well as climate change and increasing acidity and health. Uh, that's still a very important factor for a lot of people that consume wine or don't consume wine now that might in the future if the wines do not contain sulfites. And uh, though the further research would uh, sort of need it is the uh, larger scale experiments of non-saccharomyces yeast. Many of the experiments that have been done are on lab scale uh, or bench top levels um, and we sort of need that at higher levels to ensure that these this bioprotective qualities are seen at, at larger scales, uh, as well as better controls. Many of the wineries sort of lacked a uh, total control of no SO2 use and then also no bioprotective use to see what, what act exactly is the effects of these non-saccharomyces yeast, as well as the antioxidant capabilities. Uh, so the antimicrobial quality is one important factor of, of the use of SO2 but the antioxidant capabilities are, are important as well. And that needs to be researched further. Um, but these, this represents a very new and very uh, important field that could be very useful in the future. Anyone who's able to sort of use non-saccharomyces yeast and able to limit their use of SO2, maybe use a, a small amount of SO2 in addition to fire protected wines, could then uh, open their market into a field that's Quite, quite open and it's very profitable as well. Many of the food industries have had organic products, uh, especially in beer or, or other um, spirits and liquor, uh, brand themselves as organic and that does see increased sales and increased profits as well. And so I'd like to acknowledge all my fellow classmates who made this year very, very special, very memorable for me. Um, and then my, my advisor, Dr. Ben Montpetit, um, my academic advisor, Dr. Waterhouse, the Davis Viticulture and Knowledge Organization, uh, which I'm a part of, and then of course, the, all the Venn department and the uh, faculty and staff, and then also the uh, wine, spectator, wine spectator, Johnson Coleman, member of uh, ASCV, Peter J. Shields, and Henry A. Uh, Jastro, and Unotrex for helping support me through my, my studies. And that is my presentation. So any more questions? Hey, Stephen, uh, I had a question. Great job. Um, so my question's a little bit more about um, malolactic fermentation. So in your research, did you come across anybody studying, you know, whether or not these non-saccharomyces yeast were able to complete malolactic fermentation without the a, a need of additional inoculum or whether or not the killer factors that were persisting had any effect on lactic acid bacteria that might need to be added for MLF? Um, yeah, so the many of the non-saccharomyces yeast, their killer factors, um, they don't affect the bacteria at all. Um, and so some of them, like I said, do can participate in, in malolactic fermentation, but there's only a few species that are able to. But um, I, yeah, I don't believe any of the saccharomyces yeast inhibited any of the bacteria important for uh, malolactic fermentation. Um, and using less sulfites and using more uh, of the, the fire protecting species, uh, you're able to allow um, certain, certain bacteria which are more sensitive to SO2 to complete fermentation, uh, such as Enococcus, you know, it's sort of the most commonly used bacteria, uh, which is also very sensitive to SO2. So you'd actually helping in limiting your, your inhibition of, of the Enococcus uh, bacteria um, complete. Uh, now active fermentation by using a fire protecting species. All right, thank you. Great job. Thank you. All right, well, if that